um, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So while I'm at the at debt one, I end up going to air salt school, you know, pretty early. And that's, you know, if, if you're doing decent things, they'll, you know, give you these carrots. Hey, we want to send you to, to air salt school. And the, the, the funny thing, J.D., and, and I think um, nowadays airmen, they do it differently, but they kind of study in advance schools they want to go to where they want to be, you know, within the career field. Man, I didn't do any of that. Any of that. I, yeah, I just yeah. showed up, you know, let's work hard and whatever happens, happens. And then luckily for me, the career field and some, some of my supervisors recognized, hey, this guy's got a little bit. Let's push him. Mm -hmm. And so the first push was was Air Assault School. And the reason I bring up Air Assault School, because that's actually where I met Angie at. Oh, OK. So, so I go to <laughs> I go to Air Assault School and it has to be. It's nine. Yeah, I got I got to Fort Bragg in 89. So it's 90. It's April of 90. I go to Air Assault School. So I'm in air assault school and, you know, you're all highly motivated and you're thinking it's going to be a lot harder than it really is and stuff like that. <laughs> so while in school that first week, I end up going to the to the DFAC with two army guys. So I never forget this, a staff <laughs> sergeant and a buck sergeant. And I'm an A1C. And so we're in a DFAC for dinner and, you know, we're, we're talking back and forth. And Angie comes in at the time. She had been in the military a good, you know, three months or so. And uh -huh. so she's a straight up private, but she's, she gets her trade and we're all looking. It's like, man, that girl right there. <laughs> yeah. the and I, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to just talk to her. And so she starts passing by and, and I stop her. Like, hey, why don't you, you know, why don't you eat with us? And she's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, come on. You know, we're for our salt school. You eat with us, blah, blah, blah. And, and the other guys are, they're on to it as well. Yeah, you know, come on and eat with us. And she keeps on saying, no, no, no. And so me, I'm like, all right. I said, check this out. I said, why don't you point at the person you want to stay here and the other two will get up and leave? And she <laughs> oh, says, yeah. yeah, she still says, not going to do it. <laughs> right? So I kept on, you know, putting a little bit of pressure on her. And finally, she points at me. And man, when she points at me, JD, I look at those army dudes. I said, see ya. <laughs> that, that, that didn't go well, but they did. They got up. You know, they, yeah. get up and they, they leave and go set someplace else. So me and Angie, we have dinner together at Defect. You know, and then we we just see each other, you know, throughout the time I'm at Air Assault School. Go back to Fort Bragg after I graduate from Air Assault School. And now this is late April. And then, of course, August, you know, August 2nd is when when um, Iraq invades Kuwait. Right. And so at the time, I don't understand the whole thing about deployments. We were on cycle and I, I got that, but I didn't understand how the deployment process worked. Sure. So, of course, we we get notification of the invasion. I'm in the barracks now. And so from the barracks, walk to work. And we're like, everybody's on lockdown. Like, what's going on? And they start talking about this planning to go to to um, Iraq. And I, I'm still, I'm good. I'm like, I, oh, but I'm, I don't know how stand out this works. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> All right, right. Well, sure enough. So, so I get called up on the second. We go in the work. Then throughout this, you know, 24 hour, 72 hour period, Hey, you got to get your bags. You got to do all these things. So I'm going through the process, getting my bags. And in my mind, I'm not, it's not registering that I'm going to deploy it. Yeah. Get our bags, go to green ramp, you know, with our vehicles and all that kind of stuff. And fast forward on the 9th of August, 1990, I am in Saudi Arabia. So we're talking like a five day window I'm, I'm an A1C now, but what was funny to me is I remember my supervisor, Paul Gayhart. You know, they're sending us out on all these different chalks. And Gayhart tells me, hey, Aaron Lindsay, you're responsible for the vehicle. We may not fly together, but I'll see you on the other side. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with that. So I'm the only airman in this pool of Army people, of course, as an A1C. <laughs> so sure enough, get boarded on, on a 141 with the vehicle getting to Saudi. Now I'm like, I just got to find out where, where gay hearts at, you know, once we get to Saudi. And so the first place I go to is, is happens to be the division talk. Uh -huh. And I walk and I am by myself. I'm all kitted out, have all the secret stuff in briefcases. And I walk into the building and I'm just going to find an, an open office door and I'm going to find gay heart from doing this. Uh -huh. And so, so I see <laughs> the door, I go through it and there's a guy sitting down writing. And I said, excuse me, sir, can you tell me where the ALO is at? And JD, this guy looks up and all I remember seeing is stars. And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, this is probably not good. <laughs> he, goes, 
<laughs> he sets his pin down, and by the time he sets his pin down, some lieutenant from another you know door comes flying in. He's like, "Come on, I'll show you where he's at." So he pulls me out of the office. He says, "You realize that's the division commander, General Timmons?" And I'm like, "I, I didn't know until he yeah. set up. Yeah, I realized it then." And he, <laughs> you, know, you can't just go in his office like that. I'm like, yeah, "I understand." So yeah, he links me up with Gay Hart, and then that whole Desert Storm, Desert Shield piece begins. And and when when you talk about that deployment for me, is what what I recall is how um, everything was still bear based. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I remember the army getting in deuce and a half and going downtown for to get our lunch. So you know th- this is a you know a, a thirty to forty five minute trip to Hardee's is actually what they were doing. Oh. They go to Hardee's, they pack <laughs> hundreds of these doggone, you know, meals into a truck. It was a burger, a fry, and a drink. And they yeah. would bust it back. So you're talking about like two hours later, and we would go to the back of the deuce and a half, and they just throw you out a bag and, you know, grab a drink. So you're talking about, you know, um, wilted fries, cold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we thought it was so good because, man, we're, we're getting hardies, you know, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. And so we, we, were, we were actually living. It was three of us, you know, we linked up. Once the team got together, three of us living in a Humvee. So we stayed in the Humvee because there was no um, there was no lodging. There were no tents. There was no tent city or anything. Oh, we man. stayed in Humvees for a couple of probably three or four weeks. We were in Humvees. And then from Humvees, we moved into a huge. Um, it was an open like hangar. OK, and we, you know, we brought a bunch of cots in and, and I'm it's probably, man, four or five hundred people in there. Women, men, everyone just laying in their different services and. While we were there, no latrines. And so one of our guys, the Air Force guy, made a dog on. It was a stand, a toilet seat stand where you could go and, and take it in, in you know, little holes and you yeah. know, sit it down and use that. But because there were so many people in this hangar, everybody got sick. And so it was you can you know what that's like. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, so we're all sick. And then once, you know, once we get out of the out of the hangar, we move to a um. It was a tent. We had an Air Force tent. Matter of fact, I think I sent I sent a picture to you. It was the um the yellow tent. Oh know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Person tent. We moved into that tent and we stayed in that tent for probably four or five months. Really? And, yeah. The thing about the tent, of course, you know, dirt floor. We uh-huh. brought in some plywood. We made floors and stuff. And there were four of us that lived um, in the tent. But again, no, you know, no air. No water, oh, no latrine, God. no anything, and and because that's the really that's the first deployment. You think that's, that's sure. how it is. Yep. And so and you I, guys are kind of like staging before anything kicked off, and they, yeah, were they so, trying to figure so really, out what was going on? Or yeah, so so but you know the eighty second, as everyone would say, hey, that that's that's America's speed bump. You know, in case something kicks off, you got to slip right. down, we bring the eighty second in. So at the time, we weren't sure what was going to happen. They just knew that they had to get American troops on the ground fast. And so the division, you know, came in and then it, be, it became this waiting thing of, of what are we going to do? Okay. And then over the over the course of, you know, of this, you know, these four or five months, that's where, you know, Air Force City stood up. All the aircraft are coming in and things like that. But for a, you know, for a good August, September, I'm thinking in my mind for probably four or five months, we just stayed in one place, kind of like, what, what, what are we going to do? You know, what, what's what's Iraq going to do and what's our response going to be? And of gotcha. course, you know, I, I'd imagine now that, you know, the the um, the higher brass, they were planning on, on actions for us. A1C, I don't know. I'm just I'm just here just right. doing, what I'm, doing what I'm told to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So so really nothing for when did we move? We had moved from we're on a place called Champion, Maine, and we moved from Champion, Maine. And we started heading north. I believe it was in January when we started actually, you know, moving and convoying um, further north. Okay. At that time, were you getting any intel updates about, you know, I know uh, Iraq was trying to move into Kuwait or had they already been in there and you had to go in there and liberate it. Right. I mean, it was kind of like that situation. Yeah. What, what, I, remember, what I understood from that point is, is um, Iraq had occupied some areas within Kuwait. Okay. Yeah, but not not advancing. Just kind of got there and, and, and occupied. And, and then if there was, you know, I think we had two courses of action. One was if they continued to move south, we would go and you know and, and face them one on one and try to push them back. And, and then the other thing is, they if they just stayed in place, that's where we had time to build up and decide what we wanted to do. You know, in coordination with the Kuwaitis and things like that. Okay. So as you were moving north, did you get into like how was that? Was it did you meet any resistance or were you? I know there's a lot of. Um, as an as an airborne unit, 
-hmm. probably not the best uh, asset to go against the tanks of the Iraqi army, but I know you guys got into it a little bit. So tell me about that. Tell me about like actually, you know, getting into Kuwait and seeing how that was and, did you meet the enemy and how, how did that all fold out? Yeah, for us. So we, we convoyed up, of course, and, and you know, there were, there, you know, the 101st was involved, a bunch of different organizations, the, um, the folks at the 15th day sauce, you know, the armor teams, everyone was, was involved. And we did the, you know, those envelopes, we all, you know, went around and, and came in from different, from different angles. And yeah. what, what th- there's another story that I thought was pretty funny that, that kind of <laughs> happened during that time. And our, the biggest threat for us was the, um, the threat of chemi- chemical munitions. Oh yeah, that's right. I was going to yeah. bring that up. Yeah. And so we, you know, we, we are trained up on, on mop and what do you do? And, and, you know, all these different things. And then we drilled like every week we would drill on, you know, we can attack, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And there was at one point we were staging this, we had moved once, you know, further North and we staged out of, I don't know if it was an airfield or where it was at, we're standing in an open bay and we, I mean, our, our chem suits are at the ready yeah. and we have found a bird, a little parakeet that we had caught. And we said, okay, if we get attacked, you know, by Kim's, we can look at the bird. If the bird, you know, dies, we know we better get it on because, you know, there's kind of smart, <laughs> smart. Going on. So, so one night we're in our hooches and you could hear, you know, scuds being launched and you could see them being intercepted by Patriots. I mean, oh, you, wow. you could look out in the sky and you could see, you know, the bloom and you could see the interceptions going on. Jeez. <laughs> well, that one. At one time, this one hits and it, it's like it's over us and everyone looks and it's J.D. It's probably 12 of us in this dang open bay. But we look and we're like, I, I think we just got kimmed. And J.D., we we look at this <laughs> doggone bird, all of us. We look at this bird and the bird just sitting there and where we are not sure. We start throwing doggone Kim gear on. We get all Kim up and we go back and let's let's look at the bird because the bird's gonna die any second. Yeah. <laughs> so we're looking at the bird and nothing. So so we figure out. And number number one, the alarm didn't go off. It was just oh, us yeah. being proactive, like, hey, I think we're gonna, you know, we're getting it. So um that, that was one of the fun funnier stories that kind of happened along the way where we're like, hey, we're gonna get Kimmed at some point. Well, so, yeah, because how would you know? I mean, it, you know, with those patriots shooting down the scuds, I mean, does it like does it disperse in the air does it you know does any of it come down he goes, hey, you don't know so That's i mean we didn't know yeah it was, it was, <laughs> it was funny we, we all laughed about it you know I, at some point but at the time it was pretty serious like oh man I think oh gonna- yeah so um fast forward after that piece once we actually get into into iraq so the things that really stood out to me in in iraq and we went up you know through kuwait through um, I forget the, all the names of the different cities but where all the um, oil fields were burning and things like that mm-hmm. was really the destruction and so I don't know if you ever heard about the um, that six lane highway. Uh, yeah, I've heard. So I've heard the six it. lane highway is where the Iraqis were really um, escaping, you know, or getting on the highway and they're just, you know, all of them are heading back north, you know, going back to wherever. But the um, the assault that the U.S. and it's really the, um, you know, the, the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, even the Army with helicopters put on the Iraqi forces. Man, I, you talk in your face and. You know, by the time we get, you know, through Kuwait and start getting into Iraq, you would still see just the remains of all kinds of stuff, you know, from you know, military vehicles all blown up from, yep. I mean, bodies on the roads, you know, where, where you could tell, you could almost tell the aircraft that it, um, that it hit some of these people, you know, especially the oh, ones yeah. that were shot up with guns and things like that. But it oh, was yeah. just, I mean, all over the place. And so we did, well, first, no resistance. But we did capture a bunch of Iraqis. And but what was happening was when when we were, you know, getting into these different positions, they were giving themselves up. They, they, I mean, no, no fight at all. Just I'm like, I am done with this. But when you can just see the the um, the level of damage that the U.S. put on them in a very short amount of time, you could almost understand why. You know, oh, they, for sure. Yeah. The, the technology, the training, all those kind of things. You, it was it was evident once you got into Iraq and started just kind of going, you know, through the different things, but I'm talking yeah. to say weapons, you know, let, let me leave them here. Munitions. Let me leave them all your stuff just all over the place where they just said, I'm, I'm out. So how was that getting those guys? Did you have to uh, secure them at all times or was it just like, are you flex cuff them and leave them? And then somebody comes in behind you and gets them or how'd that work? Oh yeah. Flex cuff and, and, and securing and, and how the eight and second was just kind of securing them just in, in um, certain locations so they could transfer them. But um, like I said, no, no resistance at the time. We didn't have, you know, facilities set up where you could actually um, transport and move them. Oh, okay. 
So yeah, you guys barely had facilities to take care of yourselves, let alone a yeah. bunch of Iraqi soldiers. Look, yeah, look I mean, can you... the, the the thing about that too that stands out to me is just the the um the accessibility to um to weapons and, and things like that. And what I mean is, we were finding caches of Soviet um, um, laws. You know, they're light anti-tank weapons. I mean, we would find, it's, you know, hundreds of them all stacked up, you know, live. I mean, so, we, you know, you'd have guys who would get them and you'd, you'd mess around with them. It's like, man, these are actually, you know, live munitions that are out. We had guys who, um, you know, who would find some of the grenade fuses and things like that. So the accessibility of of, um, of weapons, I mean, it, it was at everyone's hand. So I'm really, you know, I don't, I don't know if you go back and, you know, through history and look at how many folks were injured because of what was on the battlefield, but, but it was there. You know, I remember oh, for sure. Yep. I, I remember going through one area we're going through and there's an, there's a, a um, it was a CBU 58 um, container. So, you know, cluster bomb, you know, how the, the shell opens up and I, we roll right up on, on the actual, um, the shell where it says, see, oh you're like, holy smoke. You know, we ended up going on um, to Lil air base, you know, we, we get out there and, you know, we're going through and, and there was a bunch of planes and things like that, that never were able to take off from from that air base you know gator minefield those are things that you talked about you know you never really see it but we actually saw you know gator minefield when you walk out you're like whoa this is a minefield this is what it is so yeah. things like that always stuck to me because in training you know and, and when you're getting ready for competitions you hear about those things but you right. rarely actually see those things yeah and they're always telling you like a cbu and the thing about those they could be anywhere so if you're walking up on the close on the canister then who knows if all those bombs went off? You know, you know, I mean, gee whiz, how dangerous. There's must have been so much UXO around there. Oh, Not yeah. only the caches, but yeah. just like all over the place from day yeah, even or, hours. You know, so you know, yeah. I, I was able to physically see a um it wasn't exploded yet, but a um combined effect munition with the shoot, you know, with that little billet still in the back yeah, of yeah. It's in the can. You're like that that's live, you know, that, that thing can blow up at any time. But it was, I mean, it really littered the the battlefield, you know, during that time. Yeah, that would be some good uh, competition study material there, just to go, just to go through there and see all that stuff, man. So, um, what ended up happening after that? Like, what uh, did you like? I know it didn't, like I said, it didn't take very long. Mm -hmm. But um, how long were, did you guys actually stay in that area before you redeployed? Yeah, I want to say we stayed in the area till till sometimes in March. And and the reason I remember it was March. So my birthday is the fifth of March, and I'd kept a. I had a calendar and for some reason I just started jotting down what I was doing every single day while I was in um, Iraq. Smart. And on the fifth was one of the first days that it had rained. And, I, and I'm like, you know, we're, we're living in a vehicle now. And I tell the JTAC, I said, um, buddy Wilborn, he was, he was, he was a JTAC. Yeah. I was in Charlie four. And I said, hey, I said, I think I'm going to take a shower. He's like, what? I said, I'm going to take a shower. <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean you're going to take a shower? I'm like, it's raining outside. Let me go and take a shower. And so, so JD, I go out in the back of our Humvee and I get, you know, everything comes off except my jungle boots. And I, right, I, get, right. I get my soap and I, you know, I start soaping up and, you know, it's raining and everything's good. And it stops raining about midway through. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I get, you know, let me, let me get the towel and wipe all this thing, you know, soap off me now. But, um, but I, so, thought, I could see that happening. I'm like, it's sure enough, it's not going to stop. It's going to stop raining. Yeah. Yeah, so March, you know, March, we're still in Iraq. We came back, I want to say, um, late March. You know, okay. that's when we got back into um, into Kuwait. And then it just became a, a drill of getting your vehicles ready to to um, redeploy. And yeah. some of the, the rules there were, you know, not not a grain of, of sand, you know, can be yeah. in your vehicle and stuff like that. So it became just a, a big drill of cleaning everything up, you know, making sure we have all of our kits so we can, you know, go back home. And we ended up getting back to Fort Bragg sometime in April. Hey.